Hello and welcome to Peter's Corner. My name is Peter Lanzillo. Today I have a couple of guests that I'm excited to introduce, but you have to wait a minute. I have a question for you, and by the end of the show, we're going to answer it for you. This is the question. What kind of government do we have here in the United States? Think about that, write your answer down, and we'll get back to it by the end of the show. Okay, I'm excited to introduce today the founders of Liberty First University. I have with me Christian, Christian Hall mm -hmm. and her husband, J.C. Hall, the Reverend J.C. Hall. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for coming. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and I am Thank so you. happy to have you guys. Appreciate it. I'll take a shake. <laughs> I, I went to a seminar yesterday in Nashua, and I was blown away by the knowledge you people have. But we're not going to talk about Liberty First first. We're going to talk about the two of you. Okay. Where you come from, your background, give us a little bit of insight of where you come from. And ladies first. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Ann Hall. We have our website, chrisannhall.com, which is K-R-I-S-A-N-N-E-H-A-L-L.com. I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, got an undergraduate degree in biochemistry, uh, wanted to be a doctor, joined up with the military to go through the uh, medical school in Bethesda, Maryland, and that's where I met my husband. I went through the U.S. Army's Russian linguist program in Monterey, California, and my husband happened to be there as well. Um, he was my instructor. So so tell me something in Russian. <laughs> Zdrasvitya. Cool. She, she remembers. <laughs> yes, yeah, just a little bit. Um, but uh, when I was in the military, I actually broke my hip. And it's, it changed my focus on, on where I wanted to be. Uh, plus, my husband and I got married, have a family, and seemed that with my, my injury from service and the family, the whole doctor thing just sort of fell away. And I found myself just occupying my time at a local attorney's office being a, um, a secretary. And it occurred to me that I really liked the research part of it. I really enjoyed the writing part of it. But then I recognized I was doing all the work and he was making all the money. Now let me ask you a question. Were you still in the military at this point or because of your accident, uh, your hip, were you out of the military? I was out of the military, okay. yeah. I uh, was honorably discharged, disabled uh, veteran status. Okay. I had a total hip replacement uh, 18 years ago. Wow. And uh, so that, that sort of is what changed everything for me. And so I went to my husband and I said, uh, you know, this guy's making all the money. I'm doing all the work and it doesn't seem that difficult and it's kind of fun. What do you think about me going to law school? And my husband's really laid back and he said, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Go for it. I told him this morning. I haven't heard him say more than three words. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get him on a roll and he gets passionate just like I do. And so I went to law school, got a law degree. I was a prosecutor for the state of Florida for a decade. I took a sabbatical within that time and worked for a nonprofit law firm dealing with First Amendment law, focusing primarily on religious liberty and freedom of speech and freedom of press, that sort of thing. And uh, when I went back to the state attorney's office after my sabbatical, there was a change in leadership. And the new elected state attorney, I don't know, do you call them DAs here in New Hampshire? I try to stay away from that. <laughs> okay. Well, DA, if you're district attorney, state attorney, they're the same things. They're just, you know, the same title for different, uh, uh, different titles for the same people in different states. And the uh, local school board asked me to come and give them a legal presentation on how to uh, conduct invocations before the school board meetings without getting the ire of the ACLU or the freedom from religious, uh, religion people. And so I gave them a presentation and from that things sort of just sparked for me. The local, I started teaching at the local school district. I started teaching local groups, grassroots groups. I was on the radio actually, the local radio station, talking about how the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional. 
And apparently my new boss heard that and he sent me an email and he said that I had to cease and desist all my association with right-wing fringe groups and that I had to cease teaching the Constitution the way I was teaching it. And what would constitute a right-wing fringe group? I don't know, maybe middle schoolers, the <laughs> school board, <laughs> you know, I don't know. But uh, anyone, who, anyone who disagreed with his uh, political stance. Yeah, so that, that's pretty much it. Anybody who disagreed with his political stance. So um, he told me that for anybody who works in government, because I was a working for the state of Florida, anybody who works for government and teaches that the Constitution of the United States demands limited government is engaging in an ethical conflict of interest. Hmm. Yes. So I had practiced First Amendment law. I knew that he couldn't tell me what to do on and off my own time, right? And so I sent him back in an email and said, you know, I'd be happy to give a disclaimer saying I'm not representing your office or you, but I'm not going to stop teaching and you can't ask me to do that. And he simply replied, I don't care. You can do what you do on, on your own time or you can work for me. And uh, my husband was pastoring a new church at the time and my income was the only income that we had. So we, for me, it was a very difficult decision to make and we prayed about it. And my husband came to me and he said, I, I think we should consider the fact that you've been teaching people that history always repeats and that the trials and the stands that our founders made for us will return to us one day. We, we've been past the gauntlet, we're gonna have to make these decisions. He said, don't you think it might be a little hypocritical for us to say, well, we meant you and not us? And he said, but you know, above all that, I know we both believe that liberty is a gift from God and that God is our provider and our protector. And if we take this stand for his glory, he won't abandon us. He said, maybe it's time for us to take a bigger step in faith. And so I sent my boss an email and said, I'm not going to stop teaching. He said, okay, well, then you're going to have to quit. And I said, no, I'm not going to quit. Uh, you did not give me this right. I'm not going to trade it to you for your paycheck. And he said, okay, well, then you're fired. And it kind of went national. We were on the local news. We were, I was on Neil Cavuto for like 15 seconds. Did the ACLU <laughs> come to your side and represent you? No, they no. did not. What but a we had a really great attorney who did. Okay. A, a local attorney who practiced uh, constitutional law like I did. Really, really great guy. And um, he helped us all the way. And um, here we are. Here we are today. <laughs> stepped out by faith we've for nine years now we have averaged uh, 265 classes in over 22 states every single year uh, for the last six or seven years we actually vacationed at home because the the entire United States was our ministry we've been to 48 of the states including uh, Alaska and I've taught middle school, high school, uh, citizen groups, churches. I've taught the legislators in session of 10 states. I teach law enforcement courses that qualify for continuing education credits for law enforcement all across the country based on the singular principle of liberty and the Constitution's dedication to the rights of the people. Wow. That's a mouthful. Yes. <laughs> JC, how about you? Uh, well, I, I grew up in North Florida, um, Navy vet. That's where we met. I was teaching Russian at the Defense Language Institute. Um, I worked at I worked at the National Security Agency back when we spied on other people and not our own people. Um, and we moved back to Florida. It's my hometown when we left the military. And um, I, uh, I pastored. Uh, church for a while was youth pastor and then full-time pastor we planted a, a church brand new you know pioneering work when all this stuff went down and um, uh, it basically you know through through that event we've been traveling 
um, teaching the Constitution and the history of the Constitution. This is the ninth year, and um, I, I have uh, several classes from a, from a gospel perspective, from biblical perspective that we teach, and also some black history uh, lessons based on my, fam my family's um, history as African slaves, my great-great-grandfather, and, and uh, so we, we try to bring forth some history that's been stolen from the American people about um, black patriots and black founding fathers and mothers and their role in, the, in building this nation prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and basically we've, we've uh, and we mix in, you know, some evangelism, preaching the gospel. We're now working um, at a uh, university, a Bible university in Tampa to bring these principles there and, and get them out to a new generation and uh, basically send out an army of people who believe in liberty that, that want to right the ship. So that's where we are today. Wow. Our work at River University is very exciting uh, because the, the pastor has brought us on board to take, they have uh, the foundation of a school of government they've been teaching for a few years. Now, where's this? This is in Tampa, Florida. Okay. It's called River University. Okay. And they've had a school of government there. And the uh, state of Florida has approved them to be a full-fledged university. The uh, city of Tampa has approved the building of an entire campus. And they've brought us on board to transform this, this seed of school of government into a pre-law program that will eventually become a law school. Can you imagine a law school dedicated to the principles of liberty for all, uh, natural law, and the, the foundation that all power in government comes from the people and not from the government to the people? It sounds like what the founding fathers of Harvard University had in mind. That's right, that's right. Well, Princeton was started uh, by one of our founding fathers, well, several of our founding fathers, and that was the very principles that, that, that Princeton University was started. Yeah, yeah. So, we, and now you work for Liberty First University. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you came about, said, one day you just said, hey, let's start a university, let's start this <laughs> program. Uh, how did that come about? Well, we are not a degreed program. Our, our, uh, uh, my, my sort of focus here, the mission statement, is get an education, not a degree. Because a lot of people get degrees and never learn anything at all, right? So we are about teaching the truth of history, government, and the Constitution, not revision and the propaganda. So what we do is we deal with original source texts. We teach the foundations of America. We teach American history. We teach the U.S. Constitution. We teach uh, the role of state governments in our constitutional republic, all based on what the designers of the system wrote and said themselves. So we're bringing forward their teaching, actually. And the sort of channel, channeling, channeling. <laughs> the, the drafters yes. of our founding documents. That's, that's the, the challenge today. You look at a lot of, um, you know, not to be hypercritical, but you look at a lot of the so-called constitutional education and even in maybe what we'd point to as conservative sources or what have you, they, they still take this approach in dealing with the Constitution where they, they teach what some experts say about the Constitution. Where the approach we, we take is, well, since the people who actually wrote the Constitution wrote reams and reams and reams explaining why, explaining what it meant, why don't we ask them? Why don't we say and teach people what the people who actually wrote it said and not some second-hand, third-hand expert? And so... Somebody who's, you know... And that's what goes on in our law schools. years beyond the actual yeah. experience. And uh, the first thing that really opened my eyes to all of this was the realization that I didn't really learn anything about the Constitution itself in law school. Uh, people may be shocked to know that law schools don't teach the Constitution. They teach what they classify as constitutional law. And it's what J.C. said. It's not what the people who wrote the Constitution said about its proper application and operation. It's what people who say, who read things about what other people say. And it's about what the Supreme Court said. It's about what this 
professor said, about what this philosopher said, when in reality the Constitution being a contract, from a legal perspective, contract law dictates that the uh, meaning of the contract must first come from the drafters and the ratifiers of the contract before it comes from anywhere else. And so as I started studying and, and as I started teaching, I started realizing that what I see on the internet, what I hear coming out of the professor's mouths, what I hear coming out of the politician's mouths and the justice's mouths are not the Constitution itself, but what other people have said. And it's sort of like that game you played when you were a kid called telephone, where you whisper in somebody's ear and they whisper all the way around the circle and by the time it gets back to you, it's not even remotely close to what you actually said. That's what we've done to the Constitution and that's over become, the last 150 years. And that's become the nature of you know, what we call judicial precedent, where it's essentially error, piled upon error, piled upon error, piled upon error. And nobody takes the time and says, you know, okay, we've listened to what 40 people down the line have said about this thing for 100 years. Why don't we stop and let's go back to the original source and, and see what they said when it started out to line up what all these people have said with it. And, and I think that's what we've missed for many, many decades now and what, what has shifted us so far afield. And so that's where we, we felt compelled um, really to, to drive this thing. And I mean, it seems like a no brainer. I mean, right. doesn't this sound like common sense? Why, why well, would you just somebody... hit it right on the head? Yeah. Common sense, I've been saying for, the, for years now, common sense does not seem to play a right. part in government at all anymore. Why would you need 30 strangers who don't know you nor your wife to interpret a love letter you sent to your wife? Why not ask you, <laughs> right? If you, I mean, think about it. you write a letter to somebody. And then you write three books explaining what you meant in that letter. And nobody ever opens the book to see what you meant. But they ask, you know, all, not even your neighbors, but people in another country from another time. It's really insane. So it's, it's mind-boggling uh, how we've built the cult of the expert. And then we've convinced people that that is the only way, the only way you can understand your rights, your liberties, the Constitution, is to go to these experts, the gatekeepers, and of course, I mean lawyers, no offense to present company, they, <laughs> they say and write this stuff in a way that you can't understand in the first place, on purpose, okay? Uh, and that's why where not, we're why different. That? No, 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 that's where we're different, you know? Yeah, we, that's where she has the gift. I always tell people, because they ask about, you know, her, her book, all the books she's written and the teachings, and I, I tell them, I always use the phrase, bottom shelf. I say, this stuff is bottom shelf. This is for anybody. She is absolutely anointed and gifted to take what, you know, in some instances is complex and difficult to understand, sometimes because of the language change over several hundred years, and she makes it simple and straightforward and, and boils down these principles where anyone can get it. Most people don't realize that we stopped teaching the Constitution properly in 1833. And so unless you were born before 1833, what you've learned, I mean, and then he was saying, even in the best of classes, even in the most conservative of forums, you, you've, your education has been tainted unless you personally took the motivation to go back and do your own personal study on what the founders wrote and said themselves. Because we, we did 180 degrees in 1833 based on some political activity that was happening. The federal, those in power in the federal government wanted to stop the people from having a power to control the federal government, wanted to stop the people in their check and balance of the federal government. So instead of engaging in a, a coup to overturn who we are, instead of taking uh, the, the proper perspective and saying, okay, let's amend the Constitution, they did what those do um, covertly quite often in, in society. They retrained the society to think different about government. So we went from an understanding from a foundation that America was built on the principles of self-governance, that power comes from the people to government, and government can exercise no more power than the individual can exercise upon his neighbor, 
to a complete 180 ideology that all power emanates from Washington, D.C., and the only limit to federal power is what those in Congress can pass by a majority of vote or what by or, or by what those in the nine black robes bang their gavel to say to be true. So, 1833? 1833. Before that, we taught what? After that, we taught what? Before 1833, our schools and the students of law and government studied a handbook on the Constitution written by a man named St. George Tucker. St. George Tucker was a member of the Continental Congress. He was an advisor to those who wrote and ratified the Constitution. And what he did was he compiled the writings of uh, Justice Blackstone, who was the premier uh, jurist uh, in England that our founders relied upon in understanding natural law and understanding how laws and governments are built to protect the people and limit the power of government. And then he took the writings, like JC said, the reams and reams and reams of what those who wrote the Constitution during the ratification debates, what they said about the Constitution, and he combined all these sources into a, a literal handbook on the Constitution. And it was the premier authority on how the Constitution operates and how governments operate and how the people are supposed to maintain those proper operations. And it maintained the core, you know, the, the, the core uh, framework of how our republic was built in, in that the states, right, the people through their states created the Constitution and therefore the Constitution creates the federal government. So the states are the masters of the federal government, not the other way around. Uh, and the Constitution enumerates powers that the state said the federal government will exercise. If it's not there, you don't do it. Everything else that's not mentioned belongs to the states. You leave it alone. So that was the core philosophy, which we know is not what's taught in law school today when they shifted to the next guy. So in 1833, there was uh, several political crisis between, um, that, that turned around Factions. 1828, 1830, 1831, all the way to 1833. Uh, the struggle of power to maintain a check and balance of federal government on the outside and to secure the power of federal government from the inside. So you have this clash. So what happened was in 1833, the educational institutions turned aside this handbook written by St. George Tucker and picked up a brand new handbook written by a Supreme Court justice by the name of Joseph Story. Joseph Story's application and rendition of the Constitution set up two of the most destructive principles to our, our government today, federal supremacy and judicial supremacy, establishing that this error because this is one of the things that really, really sparked my passion in really getting involved in this. Everywhere I went, people kept saying, and politicians say this, and professors say this, and, and, and judges say this, the supremacy clause establishes that the federal government and its laws are superior to the state laws and state constitution. That is not true. That is not what the Supremacy Clause says. However, that's what Joseph Story's handbook teaches. And it just takes a sixth grade education in grammar and the few minutes it takes to actually sit down and read the Supremacy Clause, which is Article 6, Clause 2 of the Constitution, to know that's not what it says. The Supremacy Clause establishes that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land and everything else is underneath it including the laws created by Congress. The Supremacy Clause actually establishes that laws made in Washington, D.C. that are not made consistent with the Constitution are null and void, no law at all. And wow. this is what's happened now through the Joseph Story teaching. Wow, where would we be today if you took all the laws that didn't conform with the Constitution and made them all null and void. Well, you would have... You'd have a lot more liberty. You'd have a lot more <laughs> liberty. You'd have a lot more prosperity. 
you'd have a lot more uh, freedom in business. See, because the uh, EPA is not authorized by the, for the federal government by the Constitution. If you're going to have environmental protection, it has to be done on the state level. That's a power reserved to the state. The ATF is not a federal authority. Not only do, did we not delegate the power to the federal government to regulate alcohol, tobacco, or firearms, we actually specifically prohibited them from being involved in the regulation of our right to keep and bear arms. By the way, that, that's what always receives criticism, the people mm -hmm. who, who don't get that. Oh, you, you're opposed to any government, just anarchy, no government, you know, running naked in the wild or whatever. No, it's the idea that yeah, these are state issues. Those things are not enumerated in the Constitution. They're not authorized to the federal government. Nobody's saying don't have government. It's saying have it in its proper place. This mm -hmm. was supposed to be, these are, these are state agencies. If you want, you know, whatever agency you want, those are state level issues because the, the principles that, are, that the drafters understood and operated by was like the saying, government uh, governs best when it governs least and when it governs closest to home. So you have, uh, in theory, more control or, or more potential influence over your mayor, for instance, or your state legislators than you do over somebody in, you know, some essentially a foreign country practically in Washington, D.C., that you have very little influence over. So the fact that our drafters understood you could potentially have more influence over government that's local they wanted to put the most power in the local governments and the least power in the place where you would have the least influence because they don't want a government uh, you know getting so large that it was able to exert total control over you and then you can do nothing about it I mean I mean look at the things that go on today and so many of the states uh, you know just basically surrender to these dictates from Washington DC when DC has no authority you know, to, to, to enforce these things in the first place, but they receive that authority by the state's capitulation and the state's not standing for their own reserved powers through the 10th Amendment. So that, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that we dig into at Liberty First University and, and it's not, and this is the key, it's based on these first source authorities. It's not based on somebody's political ideology, some party, Democrat, Republican, left, right. No, it's the people who wrote the, the, the founding documents, and you know everybody should listen to her foundational class, which she gave uh, yesterday that you heard, right. which, which demonstrates, because you know somebody could hear what I'm saying, oh, you know, what did they know? These bunch of white wigged, slave owning you know, guys from 200 plus years ago, what do they know? So when you hear that history that you were privileged to listen to, you realize that they were working off of almost a millennium of uh, wisdom and information, the five liberty charters that go back over 800 years uh, prior to the 1700s that our founders drew from, uh, you know, not to mention, you know, John Locke and Montesquieu and all of these writers and political philosophers. I mean, they took the wisdom of the ages. And I, it, it's a total conceit to me that in this day and age, because I think we have access, the greatest access to information we've ever had in the history of mankind, and we have the dumbest people that we've ever had in the history of mankind. So it's, it's the height of arrogance to suggest that we somehow can figure this out better than these guys who, who, who basically refined a thousand years of blood-bought wisdom into our founding documents to give us these principles to protect our individual liberty. And now we're in a state of basically ign ignorant factions wanting to control the lives of some other factions because they don't like their opinions or what they do or what have you. Uh, we've lost respect for neighbor and the ability to agree, disagree, disagree, or disagree agreeably and move on with your own life. So now everybody wants to control one another and we have this bloated government that's enabled people to do that and that's why our liberty is being crushed. And so we're trying to, through Liberty First University, in these classes, bring an awareness, number one, of the importance of your individual liberty. Number two, that that liberty is for all and it protects you. It protects you on the left just like it protects you on the right. 
if you stop trying to control. There's you no know, political party. It's not a it's, we're liberty all in is this not a together. party, right? Yeah. And and then if we go back to the sources and understand why they put these principles in our founding documents, where do they come come from? What is what is what are the principles that underlie uh, the fundamental aspects of our republic? And 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 I think if people would just simply look into that and study that, then we'd have that realization that, hey, this is not a left and right thing. It's not a Democrat-Republican thing. This is for me. This is for everybody. Liberty benefits me. These principles benefit me. I always, uh, the question always comes in my mind when I hear these politicians attack the Constitution. I think, which right are you opposed to? Do you not like free speech? Do you not want to be able to worship according to dictates of your own conscience? You want somebody to force you to, to believe what they say you believe? I, I, I just don't comprehend the opposition to these principles. And I think people don't know why they're there. They don't know what they mean. And so they really are taking a suicidal stance of opposing these principles out of ignorance. Well, when you brought up things like the EPA, I'm sure there's people in the viewing audience saying, of course they didn't have the EPA back then. They had no idea of the things we'd have today. We have nuclear power, we have radiation, we have chemicals, we have all this stuff. But they had tanneries, mm -hmm. they had logging operations, mm -hmm. they had to regulate those things, they had mining operations. If they saw right. things getting out of hand, they, they could regulate them. Mm -hmm. But you're saying state-wise, it's a state thing it was, to do. It was, it was a power that was reserved to the state. James Madison, who is known in history as the father of the Constitution. He was the fourth president of the United States under this new Constitution. He said uh, in Federalist 45, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those that remain in the states are numerous and indefinite. He said the powers delegated to the federal government by this Constitution are to be exercised principally upon foreign objects, and that's how our, our external objects, that's how our founders ta uh, talked about foreign affairs. He's, and then he names them, war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. He says to which the latter is tied the funding of the federal government. The federal government was supposed to be primarily funded through the acts of foreign commerce with only very rarely it, the, the money coming as a supplement from the people in their states on the rare occasion of war. And so he says, the powers that are reserved to the several states, the, the, the many separate independent states, are to include all the objects of the ordinary course of affairs, to include the lives, the liberties, the properties of the people, the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state are all reserved to the states. This is the guideline. The problem is, through Joseph's story and this, this educational manipulation that we have suffered now for 170 years, we have a situation now where people will say, yes, Chris Ann, we understand that, but the Supreme Court said that this is okay. And doesn't that mean that it's okay if the Supreme Court says so? Well, the Supreme Court was created to be the least powerful of all the branches. That is a statement by Alexander Hamilton, by uh, James Madison, by, by um, James Wilson, by George Mason. I mean, all of them. The, we created the judiciary to be the least powerful government. What, what, shows you you, is the, what would you say is the most powerful today? Yeah, I was just about to say that shows you how we have completely flipped it. We have it, completely degrees. flipped it. We have changed our, our federal judiciary from being literally an advisory board uh, J. Alexander Hamilton says the judiciary has no power. It has no power over the purse. It has no power over the sword. Its only authority is through advice. And we've changed them from an advisory board to advice, advise the, the legislative and executive branches to an oligarchy of nine kings and queens who make decrees that create what we now believe in our minds to be the supreme law of the land. 
How many people have heard saying, well, the Supreme Court ruled the other day? Right. The Supreme Court, re I have read thousands of Supreme Court cases. Never once do they refer to their own writings as rulings. They know they're not rulings because kings make rulings. Judges offer opinions. So They'll it's the, the media that says they ruled. It, it's, it's the media, it's the, it's the professors, it's the law professors, it's the politicians. More importantly, it's the public. But more importantly, mm. it's the public that believes it. And they'll say, well, uh, this is just a popular example. How many times have you heard, well, Roe v. Wade is the law of the land? Correct. Okay, that's not true. Lawmaking is reserved to the legislative body. But if I were to break a law of the land put down by the Supreme Court, where would I end up? You would end up nowhere unless the executive enforces it. See, yeah. the problem is there is no enforcement for the executive. And a, a judicial opinion does not make law. To say that the judicial opinion makes law or has the force of law is the most severe violation of the Constitution that can ever happen. It's called a violation of separation of powers. And if the people understood that Roe v. Wade is not a law, it doesn't govern everybody in the land. As a matter of fact, legally speaking, jurisdictionally speaking, Roe v. Wade only affects Roe and Wade. It doesn't reach outside the, the courtroom other than those two people. Now to say that it does says that laws are created by people you did not elect. Right. People who have you, no authority who, to legislate. Who have no authority to right. legislate over whom you have no control, and that is a king. So in that case, when you say, you know, you can end up in jail because of that, then you're describing a lawless banana republic. I mean, if you, if you can be thrown in jail uh, through, over something that has not even been legislated, what is that? That's a, it's a dictatorship. I mean, that's Complete. the kind of stuff you expect to find in some third world, you know, third it's, world dictatorship. It is the very definition of arbitrary power. And that's the key that St. George Tucker and the drafters and the ratifiers of our Constitution would want us to understand. That when our federal government becomes arbitrary, becomes lawless, violates the, the limited and defined nature of the Constitution, it is incumbent upon the states and the local governments to step up and say no. Okay, Roe v. Wade is not a law. And we're not going to enforce that here as if it were law because the federal government has no law enforcement capability within, uh, no law enforcement authority within the states. Oh. That rests on the, on the sheriff and the police department who needs to be taught that they are not subjects to the federal government, but they are representatives of the people to the securing of their liberty. But you brought up a point that it was after 1833, it was taught mm -hmm. and it's very, important to understand that as people are taught a certain thing mm -hmm. and now, now, now 2019 in Hudson, New Hampshire, we have Common Core. Mm -hmm. And the curriculum from Common Core is dictated by Washington. Mm -hmm. And there are things Which is that why are, the Department of Education was never supposed to exist on correct. the federal level. And those things that are in there may be completely different than what was in there before, mm -hmm. but they're grooming youngsters, mm -hmm. our most vulnerable people that are sucking in information mm -hmm. and looking at the teachers as being their examples, mm -hmm. but they're being taught things that are anti-constitution. Well, they're being taught things that are flat out lies so and that are not true. As a result, when they become mm -hmm. adults in the public sector, if they run for office, they will make decisions right. based on that education. Well, and that's why Liberty First University is so important. Ah. That's why the work that we're doing at Riverview University is so important. That's why people learning the truth is so important. We are not a reflection of our government. Government is a reflection of its people. That's the way our government works. If we want to change this, the, the, the point that we have to understand here that you made so very well is that our Constitution has not changed. Our form of government has not changed. 
The only thing that's changed is this. And this is what needs to be corrected. People say, it's very popular today among frustrated people to say, well, you know, I'm glad we have the Second Amendment and America needs a revolution. And I'll say to you, yes, America needs a revolution, but a revolution of the mind. Our founders sacrificed everything that they had to give us a government that was not built on kingdoms so that we could peacefully control our government, so that we could control our government more uh, completely than in a kingdom. And yet we have failed to even exercise the smallest authorities that we have and the, the smallest controls because we've been taught the wrong things for such a very long time. At, at Liberty First University, we have homeschool students. We have students who are in public uh, middle schools and high schools whose parents say, recognize, we recognize our children are not being taught what they need to be taught. We need to teach them the truth in the home. I want every parent to realize every parent is a homeschool parent regardless of where their child goes to school. I can't help but think of when you were fired mm -hmm. by your boss as, when you were a lawyer in Florida for the DA. And you can, you can have a view on the Constitution, but you can't make it public mm -hmm. or you get fired. Mm -hmm. Now that is obviously, to me, uh, uh, extreme injustice. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to go out and say, all these things were right and you knew they were wrong, they wouldn't say boo. Mm -hmm. in, in New Hampshire here, we, we're very fortunate. This is the live free or die state. Mm -hmm. Enjoy that while you have it, <laughs> folks, because it's tough to hold on to it. But we have one of the biggest legislatures in the country. There's over 400, I believe, reps. So you can have many reps from your hometown. We have like 11 between Hudson and mm -hmm. Pelham. And you can get together with these people. They're always access, you know, available. Mm -hmm. You can complain. You can yell at them. You can pat them on the back. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is we have representation. Right. And they, uh, right now, in Concord, Democrats hold the House and Senate. And they want to, there, there's a movement, they want to shrink that down. Mm -hmm. And as you shrink <clears throat> things down, you have less and less control over it because right. there's fewer and fewer people to go to. It's consolidation right. of power. Consolidation can I, of power. Can I say uh, one thing about what you said? You, you said to be fired for teaching what I taught was a great injustice. Yeah. I would say to you a greater injustice would have been if we had said nothing at all and went back to work and shut our mouths. Because we believe mo wholeheartedly that what this man meant for evil God turned into good. I can't tell you how many lives we have touched in nine years. It's, it's completely impossible. But we, uh, through what we have been teaching over this last nine years, through Liberty First University, we are retraining young people. We are, uh, we, we've had people come through our training and run for office on state and local levels, run for sheriff, defy federal government, uh, in unconstitutional federal government mandates because of what they've learned from us. I had a, uh, I was teaching at a high school one time and I had a, a young man, a senior in high school come up to me and said, Miss Hall, I, I've, I've never been taught this before but and I want you to know, I want to run for president one day. But after what you've taught me here, I will never let anybody take my liberty again. And I hear that from a, from a high school senior boy. That's not that's my toughest audience, right? And, and that is my encouragement. That's why we do what we do. That's why we fight. And we see this everywhere we go. Lives are changed futures are impacted governments. I have seen, I don't take credit for this. I believe that it's the, the, the knowledge, the power of the knowledge that we're teaching. But I have seen state legislators, after I've taught them in session, change the way they operate with their power and their obligation to the people. And when somebody says, well, you know, Chrisanne, that's great, I can go learn that, but I'm just one person. I want to challenge you. Look at history. 
every major pivotal event in history, be it good or be it bad, pivoted on the life of one person. And we need people who are willing to stop searching for the right Messiah, searching for the right leader on this earth, and start realizing that they themselves have the power to make a change. And a change that's here, I mean a little change in our little bitty town of Welburn, Florida, where nobody even knows where it exists, has spread throughout the entire country. And how much more if everybody that we've touched does the same thing? Well, I think in a nutshell, that kind of tells us where you're coming from with Liberty First University. Mm -hmm. So how would the people watching the show say, gee, I'd like to um, find out more. Okay. I'd like to maybe take some courses, take some, mm -hmm. you know, see what you're all about. Well, we have uh, libertyfirstuniversity.com. Just spell out libertyfirstuniversity.com. That takes you straight there. We also have chrisannhall.com, K-R-I-S-A-N-N-E-H-A-L-L.com, where we have a lot of resources there as well. You can get information linked right there to Liberty First University. JC and I have a, a radio show that is nationally syndicated, globally distributed as a podcast all over America that we do um, Monday through Thursday, and then we have a special weekend edition that we do where we take current events that you see in the news, you MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, but we bring them to you in such a way that we deliver them with constitution, with principle, and with historical accuracy. I think the way journalism ought to bring it, but we don't give you the propaganda, the political party propaganda, the government propaganda. We don't give you the historical revisionism. I like that word, propaganda, yeah, because yeah. unfortunately, that's a word that we don't seem to use in America. That's only for banana republics and for communists. Mm -hmm. They have the propaganda, but not in America, <laughs> even though the news of what's going on is so skewed. Well, when you skew the news, it's nothing more than propaganda. I don't know how many Americans actually know this, but it, those who listen to our show regularly know, uh, already know that in 2012, uh, our Congress signed into law by the president legalized use of our tax dollars to create government created propaganda to be used to manipulate the American people. Prior to 2012, a law passed in 1948 said it was illegal for Congress to do that. It was called the Smith Munt Act in 1948. Said, no, you can't use taxpayer dollars to create government propaganda that will influence the American people. And in 2012, our conservative Congress signed into law by the president, then overturned that law and said, okay, now you can use tax dollars to create, government can take your tax dollars and create propaganda that they know will influence the American people. Can you give me an example of that? How, how, how would they? How would they do that? Oh well, how are they controlling it's, the media? It's today? a Voice of America was specifically mm -hmm. created a, a a group, a department in the Voice of America Broadcasting, um, under the guise of obviously under the guise of fighting terrorism, mm -hmm. and and so we have to create create uh, you know some sort of information and news to. So news comes through a news wire, right? So we don't really have roving reporters anymore. What we have are news wires. So the, the media signs up for certain news wires. Well, the government now has a, their own personal funded news wire. Right. They have a board of governors with their own created news wire. Voice of America was a nonprofit private organization. Well, they've made one just like it that's now created with your tax dollars. So they have their own news wire that is now feeding information to the media. How do you know? And th this is the problem. This is why the 1948 law existed. You said, can you give me a specific example? I cannot give you a specific example. And that's precisely why the law was created because there's no way for you to know what you're hearing is actual news or something that's coming from the news wire. Uh, now yeah. couple that with this new deep fake AI that mm -hmm. can, you know, make people look like they're saying something they did not or doing something oh. that they, they did not. I mean, it's really kind of frightening stuff. Let's answer the question. Yes, I was thinking about that too. You must have been reading my mind. <laughs> what kind of government do we have here in the United States? And I bet you 90% of the people in America said? 
a democracy. A democracy. <laughs> we want to save our democracy. And they would be? They would be wrong. <laughs> we are not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic. And it's very important to make sure that we say it as specifically as that. Uh, because we're not just a general republic like Rome. We are a constitutional republic. A republic is where the laws are created by uh, representation of the people. A constitutional republic is where the government is actually created, limited, and defined in its authority by a written contract. Our written contract coming from the states that created the federal government and the republic part being that the people who select their representatives to make the laws. Now the difference, why are we a constitutional republic and not a, and a, not a democracy? Well, because a democracy is majority rule. A democracy says whoever has the most money, whoever has the most power, whoever has the most people, and not necessarily all three at the same time, makes all the rules, dictates what the minority can have and can't have, what jobs the minorities can have, what money the minorities can hold, what property they can maintain, to what level they can maintain that. Democracy is nothing more than a pretty word for masters and slaves. Because that's how slavery is, is established, when a large group of people exercises power over the small group of people. Our founders knew what that meant. So they did not create a democracy. They created a constitutional republic where minority groups have the same society changing voice as a majority group because it comes, laws are made through equal representation and not through mob rule. So we become then a constitutional republic where the government is limited by the rule of law, not by the whim and often hysteria of the mob. And it's a great distinction you made, the general public versus the constitutional republic. General public like Rome, where the people are ruled over by organs, bodies, and, and you know, Aristocracy, figures. Yeah. Right, whereas, and there's no constitution that says, here's what those bodies are allowed to do and only allowed to do. And that's the distinction. If we lose the connection with the Constitution, the Constitution goes away, then you've loosed the courts, the legislature, the executive branch. Now they do whatever they want to do. That's a general republic. That's not what we are. We're a constitutional republic. There are limits. There are rules like, like you had in your third grade class. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. So we have two and a half minutes left. Can I offer up your audience a final pop quiz? Certainly. Don't look at your phone. Don't look at your iPad. Don't pick up your pocket constitution. Answer this in your own mind. There are five liberties in the First Amendment. Name all five liberties of the First Amendment. There are national polls that say only 2% at best can name all five without looking at some kind of source. So I want to ask you, take this quiz, see what you can do, then answer this question. If you don't know what your rights are, how do you know they're not already gone? Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming here today and sharing this with us. And I think the biggest thing that people should realize, whether you're left wing, right wing, in the middle, don't know what, mm -hmm. is that if you go back to the U.S. Constitution, it benefits everybody. The person that's on minimum wage, as right. well as the multi-billionaire, mm -hmm. nobody has more power. You're mm -hmm. all treated right. equal. That's right. And unfortunately, in America today, we act like the Constitution's the bad guy. Well, and that's why we have such unequal uh, application of the law today. Yeah. That's one, exactly right. Once again, tell the viewers how they can get online and see your material. LibertyFirstUniversity.com, LibertyFirstUniversity.com, and then ChrisAnnHall.com, spelled K-R-I-S-A-N-N-E-H-A-L-L.com. In the podcast, how do you see a podcast? I'm, I'm ignorant of these things. Okay, so the podcast is available on chrisannhall.com. It's right there on the front page. We have hundreds of episodes. 
Uh, you can also hear us on iTunes, Google Mu Music Play, SoundCloud. There's a podcast called Jesus Pod that carries us. And you can watch us on YouTube. And you can watch us on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. Okay. As long as YouTube allows us to, <laughs> to carry yeah. our, our message, we will be on YouTube. And then with the YouTube channel, we actually have PowerPoint that runs next to us so you can see what the articles we're talking about in the language and everything. Wow. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you. I hope you as a viewer enjoyed today's show. And thank you for watching Peter's Corner. Thank you so much.